بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وآله التيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وأصحابه المنتجبين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى قيام يوم الدين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته <تصفيق> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم The topic for this year's discussion is the great transformation brought about by the Blessed Prophet within a span of 23 years that affected that region so decisively that they were able to carry forward the message to spread, to conquer to withstand different cultures being introduced within their own cultures, to grow through different cultures, to absorb their learning, add to their own, to give back to the world. When initially the Prophet found them as people who were scattered, warring tribes, no sense of unity or community. Tribal system was prevalent. All of that within a span of 23 years. Now that is next to impossible. Whereas when we see the previous prophets and their attempts, either we see a state of defeat within the prophet, like Nabi Nuh, Hud and Saleh, the very early prophet, like Abraham, who had to flee from region to region. Or we come to prophets that enjoyed a very restricted success, like Moses, who fled with the Israelites and the ongoing problems that he had with his community. But the host community of the Pharaoh were destroyed in their hundreds of thousands. Or with Jesus, who came to reform and to realign the Israelites with the central message that Moses had left them with, he again met with failure by the apparent standards. And then his followers carved out another identity for themselves and then spread subsequently to that. But this Prophet Muhammad وسلم, comes from level zero. He does not have the community that Moses has, nor the head start that Jesus has by taking birth within a cradle that allows him to speak. He does not have the aid of miracles, not the miracles that we can verify anyway to possibly the worst of people on the face of the earth at that point. Yet, as we will clarify, they were the best of people that ensured his success. Where Jesus and others could not succeed, Prophet Muhammad did. There was a reason for it. All of that within a span of 23 years. Now, you may say that in itself is unbelievable. But what is really unbelievable about the message of Prophet Muhammad is that he did not propagate only his message. Simultaneously, he propagated a broader message. What do I mean by that? Neither did he give the identity of Islam and Muslim to his band of followers. Beyond that, he carved an identity that allowed for all other faith persuasions belonging to Abraham to be united with them and be one community and ummah with him. 
So he carves out two levels of identity, one for the strict formal Muslim and one for the broader Muslim, and he succeeds within 23 years. And then, beyond that, he empowers them to such an extent that his being within them was not the, the central force of driving them forward, but it was his teachings that he left with them that caused them to expand, to embrace, to bring about greater goodness, to absorb the goodness of others. That really requires an em empowered state that we can take on from the learnings of the others, benefit from them, not be perturbed, not be reactionaries, not look down upon the others, do not create our message in opposition to the others, but rather to say what is good with you belongs to all of us. And hence, after the demise of the Blessed Prophet, the Muslims went to Jerusalem, where the Christians had banished the Jews. They took Jerusalem, allowed the Jews to come back within Jerusalem, allowed the Christians and the Jews to live with Muslims harmoniously, harmonious coexistence. How does he do that in 23 years? Now that is phenomenal. Genghis Khan created a community by giving them certain amount of uniformity. They spread, but they were not intellectually liberated people. And you can see that. What were their intellectual contributions? When they went to the Middle East, look at the amount of pillaging the amount of killing and murders that happen. Whereas the early Muslim conquests, we do not witness that amount of killing. And we do not witness them burning books or literature. We witness them learning from the others. That requires the initial reformer to have empowered them and intellectually liberate them. Now when we look at the factors, we find an amazing story coming out. Now, why did I choose this topic for this year? A dear friend of mine asked me, he said, what was the reason for the success of Prophet Muhammad in such a short span of time? Now, when you start looking at it, you feel that, well, no, I can't find a single factor. There is a variety of factors that are involved. And then again, the Prophet Muhammad is indistinguishable and you cannot disconnect him from the revelation. So the revelation and the Prophet Muhammad are going hand in hand in this missionary role. Three, you can't even detach his community, his circumstances and his immediate context from him. So there is a variety of things happening with the Prophet Muhammad that allow him to bring about such a transformation within his community that is unparalleled, unmatched, unequaled and unseen when the, the history of the prophets that went before him. In the history of, uh, prophetic phenomena, we do not see anyone achieving such success and transformation within their own lifetime, and that too in meager 23 years of preaching. The first thing when we look at the context, we find that no, the context was right. They were ready to receive a message. That's the interesting thing. The people around him were actually the ideal people to receive him. When we look further into it, we find that no, there are greater dynamics at play that we are not thinking about. There is something phenomenal that is happening to which we have not awoken yet. And we need to take a closer look at the Qur'an in order to decipher this. Now when we look at the Qur'an and the role of the Prophet Muhammad, it seems that it was all predestined. It was destined to happen at that very moment. And everything was coming together. It's amazing the way things are happening. There were two things that were to be done. One, safe passage for the Israelites to cross over to the other side of the sea. Two, the drowning of the Pharaoh and his forces for their insubordination 
their obstinate behavior, their rejection, not rejection, their defiance of the truth. Can you imagine? After a lengthy patch of time, both the groups find themselves at the banks of the sea. One facing a certain death, the other anticipating a certain victory, the chariots running behind them, the Israelites crying to Moses, and they are saying, now what Moses? Now what? Either we drown or we get butchered. At that point, the sea splits. The Israelites are led to safety. The Pharaoh subdues them, pursues them, and the sea is closed up. Look at the beauty of this. They were led to that point to meet there precisely. And precisely at that point, the seas were going to split. One is going to be delivered, the other one is going to be destroyed. Does that then not intrigue the mind as to what is happening in reality? There is something going on here. Something far grander and greater than what we have been able to intuate or been able to decipher or think. The best of our, of our intellectual abilities have not been able to grasp what is really happening. There is a story, a grander story that we are not awakening to. Now look at the Quran. The precise details of Qiyamah are in there. Al-Qari'ah, Mal-Qari'ah, the striking calamity. And what make, make it known to you? What is the striking calamity? Man shall be like scattered moth, moth at that day. The mountains shall crumble. When the earth shakes violently. Doesn't that sound like a meteorite striking the earth head on? It will not come to you. Save as an unexpected awakening, this qariah, this qiyamah that will come. It will come as an unexpected event. It will come suddenly. This defines our notion of qiyamah, doesn't it? The one that we normally have, the naive one, but that's also in the Quran. But that's not the human qiyamah. That, you know, the scientific qiyamah that we have, that the sun depletes its energy and it becomes a red giant and embraces the earth and then the earth dies. That is not the qiyamah this verse is talking about. This qiyamah is precisely calculated. The human qiyamah on the face of this earth. Al-qari'ah mal-qari'ah. Ida azul jilatil ardu zilzalaha. Wa hummilatil ard. Wal jibal wa dukkat. Wa dakkata dakkatan wahida. Forgive me because when I'm in my stride I forget the actual uh, Arabic of the verses. When the earth is lifted and given a, a violent shaking. This has all been mentioned in the Quran. It's all predestined. Isn't that amazing? Yet there is unpredictability in the Quran. There is leverage for change. We will discuss that as well. But look at this. How Quran awakens us that all of these things that are here are accurately and meticulously planned. Joseph's brother took him. When they gathered and they concluded that they will cast him within the depths of the earth. We reveal to Joseph at that point, There shall come a time when you shall inform them of this deed of theirs and they shall not be aware. Read Surah Yusuf. Joseph says to them, do you not remember what you did to his brother previously? They say, Anta Yusuf, are you Joseph? He recognized them, they did not recognize him. He said, Ana Yusuf, I am Joseph. The verse of the Quran that was given to Yusuf in his childhood has now been, been proven true. That you will remind them of what they are doing today. And they will not know who you are at that point. So Joseph was told of a future event that was going to transpire. Isn't this amazing? Yet, there is unpredictability. 
within the Quran imma nuriyannaka ba'd ma na'iduhum aw natawaffayannaka min qabl Muhammad either we will show you some of what we have promised to do to them or we will kill you before that it is still in the making destiny is planned destiny is being made so now when we look at the Quran we find that the cho- the prophets have been cho- chosen already in another world or wherever we need to decipher that and for that we need many more lectures but i'll just go through it iblis converses with god he refuses to prostrate god says out with you and upon you is my curse till the day of judgment you know upon you is my curse now look at what iblis says qala rabbi fa'anzirni ila yawma yub'athun o lord then spare me till the day in which they are going to be raised so iblis already has this foreknowledge that they, Adam and his progeny, will be raised on the day of Qiyamah. He already has that foreknowledge. God says, you will be spared till this appointed time. Then what does he say? Allah, O Lord, through your might, ajma'in. I shall misguide them all. Illa ibadaka minhumul mukhlasin. Save for your slaves or servants those amongst whom have been chosen. So he knows about the prophets as well. This is at the creation of Adam. Refusal to bow down to Adam, Iblis has all this knowledge that there will be prophets amongst them. But Adam was chosen to live inside the garden, Iblis. He was never meant to come to the earth. But Iblis seems to know that Adam is going to come to the earth. There will be prophets. The prophets was not an afterthought as we have imagined. Look at the verse. Of Surah Baqarah, Kul Nahbitu Minha Jamia, descend from it all together when Adam ate from the forbidden tree. For Imma Yatiyan Kumini Hudan for Mantabi Ahudaya Fala Hofun Alihim Walahum Yahzanun. All together descend, and whenever guidance comes to you from me, then he so he whosoever follows my guidance, no fear shall come upon them, nor shall they grieve. This verse is revealed at Adam eating the fruit after Iblis misguides him. But Iblis seems to have known this prior to this. Iblis already knows that there will be prophets coming. And this appears to be a subsequent verse. In any case, look at this verse. وَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمَّ مُوسَىٰ أَنْ أَرْدَعِيهِ And we revealed upon the mother of Moses. Nurse him. وَإِذَا خِفْتِ عَلَيْهِ فَالْقِيهِ فِي الْيَمْ وَلَا تَخَافِ وَلَا تَحْزَنِ And when you are fearful, then place him within the river. Do not be fearful, nor be grieved. إِنَّ لَرَادُوهُ إِلَيْكِ وَجَاعِلُوهُ مِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ We will cause him to return to you and we will make him amongst the messengers. This is at the birth of Moses. The revelation is telling Umm Musa, we are going to bring him back to you and we will make him into a messenger. It is already done. It's a done deal. It's destined. Look at the other verse. وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيْسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمْ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْنَ مِنَ التَّوْرَاتُ وَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ إِسْمُهُ أَحْمَدِ When Isa, the son of Mary, said to the Israelites, I am a messenger of God. I have come to verify whatever you have of the truth. And I am here to give you the good news of a messenger that will come, who will come after me, and his name is Ahmad. Isn't that amazing? Something else is happening here. These are not coincidences that suddenly the Prophet Muhammad showed up because the society was so bad and then he did everything he did. No. Things are fine-tuned. And that is why they happen so rapidly when the decree of God descends. And then the verse of the Quran, الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الرَّسُولَ النَّبِيَ الْأُمِّيَ الَّذِينَ يَجِدُونَ الَّذِي يَجِدُونَهُ مَكْتُوبًا عَنْدَهُمْ فِي التَّورَاتِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ And the people who follow the Rasul, the Ummi amongst the Ummi, the one they find inscribed and written within the Torah and the Injil. Now I know I'm giving a lot of verses, but these are relevant and necessary. I'll go through another verse. 
So that means that the Jews and the Christians have read about Prophet Muhammad in Torah and in Injil. It was already destined that he will come at an appointed time. This is the reason why the Jews and the Christians were expecting a messenger to come at that point. In any case, this is a very interesting verse. Not to say that the others aren't. وَإِذَخَضَ اللَّهُ مِثَاقَ النَّبِي نَبِيِّين لَمَا آتَيْتَكُمْ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَحِكْمَةٍ ثُمَّ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٍ مُصَدِّقٌ لِمَا مَعَكُمْ لَتُؤْمِنُنَّ بِهِ وَلَتَنْسُرُنَّهُ وَلَتَنْسُرُنَّهُ And when Allah took the covenant of the Prophet, whatever I shall give you of the book and wisdom, and then shall come to you a messenger verifying what is with you, that you will bring faith in, in him and you will assist him. He said, have you taken my pledge on this oath? And do you pledge to it? They said, yes, we agree with this pledge. Kala, fashhadu wa na ma'akum in shahidin God says, then bear witness, and I too will bear witness. Now, of course, the Muslim Mufassirin will say that the oath was taken from the people of the Prophets, but that's not the, what, what the verse says. In any case, even if it was taken from the people of the Prophets, it's talking about a futuristic event that was already planned. But if you read the verse carefully, it's a pre-worldly oath. It's a pre-worldly oath where all the Prophets were gathered and asked, I will give you a book, and when a Rasul comes, and this Rasul is not Prophet Muhammad, but this Rasul is probably Ruhul Quds or Jibreel, who brings to you what I have given you to verify it, that you will, you, you will attest to the truth of what you have received at that point, and you will begin to remember all these things. In any case, all of these verses are showing that the prophetic Arrival was predestined. Things were meant to happen. Now look at the dua of Nabi Ibrahim. Rabbana wabath fihim rasulan minhum yaslu alayhim ayatik wa yu'allimuhum al kitaba wal hikma wa yusakihim. Abraham and Ismail prayed, O Lord, send within them a messenger from them who will recite upon them your signs and teach them of the book and wisdom. In Surah Juma, God responds, الْحِكْمَة He is the one who sent within the Ummis a messenger from them who recites upon them his signs, purifies them and teaches them the book and wisdom. So we are seeing that the coming of the Prophet Muhammad was expected. It was something that was destined. And it was destined to happen at a particular time, in a particular region, to a particular people, who would be the most ideal people to act as a catalyst to spread and promulgate his message to all four corners of the world. Because the situation was It was conducive. However, the way of the human beings is a way that is gradual, the human context. It's amazing again the way the Quran is behaving, the truths that it's telling us. No, preach to them. I have preached to them, Lord, kill them now. No, now make an ark. <laughs> I've made an ark. They are mocking at me, they are laughing at me. Worry not, persevere with your ark. Can you imagine how long it takes to make an ark? An ark that will carry two, two of every animal. God is great. At one instance, He says to the fire, "Wakulna ya nar kuni baradan wasalaman ala Ibrahim." We said to the fire, "Become cold and say for Abraham, you just said it; it happened. You are saying in the Quran, "Inna ma qauluna le shayin ida aradna wa inna ma qauluhu le shay ida aradahu wa yakulu lahu kun fa yakun." He just says, "Be." And it is. Why put this poor old man through all this strife? Isn't that amazing? Nu has to go through this sequential process of inviting them, then cutting down trees, then building ark, then gathering two, two animals everywhere. But things are happening within the human context. Many other things are happening around. 
that we are not privy to or we've not opened up, but all of them are falling into place gradually. Gradual case of Prophet Moses, one sign, then the second sign, then the third sign, and ten signs come, and then he leads them to the Nile, and then they drown, right? Everything is happening within a slow, steady human context. So it's a destiny that is fixed, intertwined with the way in which humanity is operating, and everything is coming together steadily and properly. Now look at the community of the Prophet. They were on the brink of falling within the pits of hell, as the Quran says, وَذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ Remember the blessing of God upon you. إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءً When you were enemies, فَأَلَّفَ قَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ And he reconciled within your hearts. فَأَصْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَتِهِ إِخْوَانَ And through his blessings you became brothers. وَكُنْتُمْ عَلَى شَفَى حُفْرَةٍ مِنَ النَّارِ you are on the brink of falling into the fire. And he saved you from it. Now these people knew nothing but discord, tribalism, warring. There was a huge disparity between the rich and the poor. There was a class system. There was exploitation in parts. No real purpose or contentment. There were a variety of fates at that point. The cultures of the time, some of them were burying their daughters. Some of them were offering child sacrifice. Generally, there was inner and outer discontentment. If the Prophet Muhammad were to have gone to Byzantine Empire or the Persian Empire and preached his message, he would not have had the success because those people had background of knowledge. They were living in a more comfortable, secure environment, although there were ongoing wars between the Byzantines and the Persians. But those people would have objected to his message on intellectual basis, as people do. People are very obstinate. When you come out with something very reasonable and something very logical, something very obvious and intuitive, the people who don't know much will accept because their hearts will be able to intuitively accept it and their reason will agree to it. But you go to people who have studied in seminaries, in universities, they will reject you full force. You tell them, you can't curse Muslims that cause bloodshed. They will prove you're supposed to curse it and it's a part of religion and our Imams have taught it and it is Hadithul Qudsi given by Allah Himself. This is the problem. When you go to intellectually awakened people who have used their minds to justify their own ways of life. This actually is a handicap and a problem. When you go to people who are discontent with the way life is, who feel inner sense of emptiness, who feel discontentment, who feel a sense of desperation, you give them truth, they will readily accept it. The Prophet came to a people who were discontent, people who were suffering, people who were downtrodden and we will explore, express in, and, and, and we will explore in future lectures that only the very poor started coming to him initially the very rich and the warlords came to him afterwards to save their skin many people came to him for differing reasons but the fact is that the context was right their illiteracy lack of access to knowledge actually worked in the favor of the prophet and that is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala designed this particular destiny. The context was God-friendly. You might say, how was it God-friendly? They were killing. They were plundering. The fact is they were killing and plundering out of force of habit. They did not know any better. There was no other way of survival. Raiding caravans, belonging to tribes, tribal loyalties. That was the only way they could survive. Worshipping Lat, Uzza, and Manat, the three goddesses, or Ghanarin Ula, the mediaries between them and God, because God, Allah was so lofty, they did believe in Allah, or Hubal, one of their major gods. But they found no contentment or peace within themselves, so the situation was very conducive to accept God and God's message. 
So many people rejected idolatry flatly in Makkah. They were the Hanafis. And they were trying to follow the minimalistic Abrahamic faith. They were not worshipping idols at all. Some people were viewing God as the, such a lofty being that could not be reached. And that too in them, in their hearts, did not sit well. And the beautiful way in which the Quran uses these sentiments. Say, call Allah or call Rahman. Whichever one you call, for him are the beautiful names. The Arabs used to worship God, the Supreme God, with two names. Ilahan or Allahan and Rahmanan. The Quran kept those names for the sake of familiarity. Of course, Allah has a very lofty meaning, no doubt. But I'm saying that's also one of the reasons that was impactful that the same names were kept. The Jews and the Christians. Now look at this curious event. The Jews and the Christians were saying to the Arabs, a prophet is due to come and he will come to us. We will predominate. The Arabs felt unsophisticated. They did not feel people who had such noble messengers come to them from God and lead them aright. So obviously the Arabs might have had this sense of jealousy as well in them. And then suddenly they find, oh, it's an Arab messenger. Imagine the sense of pride they took. All of these things were curiously working in the favor of the Prophet. Because Jews and the Christians liked what Muhammad Rasulullah preached. They hate that he was an Arab. They hated that he was an Arab. The Arabs hated what he preached, but loved the fact that he was an Arab. It was all working. And how was it all working? It's phenomenal. The context was so ripe. And then, of course, when somebody like Muhammad Rasulullah stands and delivers the message, then they see the impeccable nature of his character, his genealogy, coming from Abraham and Ismail, coming from the lineage of the one who uncovered the Zamzam, coming from Abdullah, his father, who was ransomed for 100, cat, uh, 100 camels, the person known as the most trustworthy, as the most truthful one, a person known for his calm demeanor, his sound judgment, his penetrative insight and his wisdom, they actually felt a sense of relief as well, that he is an Arab and he is the best amongst us in his lineage. He's from the Quraysh, enjoys the protection of Abu Talib. They are the people who give water to the Hujjaj, high prestigious tribe, high prestigious genealogy, impeccable moral. All of these things were working in the minds of the people. Now, they also saw him as a human prophet. They did not see him as a miraculous phenomena. They actually saw him as a human prophet. They were saying on many occasions, Muhammad, is this your discretion or discretion of God? Are you saying this or is God saying it? And you will see as we go into these lectures, on so many occasions the Quran intervenes and put things right. On so many occasions the Quran gives direction to the Prophet. On so many occasions the Quran justifies the decision of the Prophet. And then the people find comfort with that, that no, the loftier source has condoned this decision. So we can follow his decision here. At one point they used to be critical of the Prophet about his decision. And then the Quran will intervene. And then they would say, okay, fine, now God has intervened, so that decision was right. They actually found comfort in the fact that this man is not making things up. He is being led by revelation, step by step, and he himself is growing through the experience. And this is the point I want to make today, emphatically, and stop at this. You see, they saw the prophet. They saw that he is growing with his experiences. He has no special status above us. And of course, you know that verse of the Quran, Qul innama ana basharum mithluku. I am a human like you. In fact, that word bashar is an intriguing word that we need to deal with at some point. Yuha ilayya. 
it has been revealed upon me. So he introduces himself as a mere mortal. Now think about this. Had he come like Jesus, taking birth without the agency of a father, speaking inside his cradle, being pedestalized like God, who would have followed him? You cannot emulate a person like that, can you? You've made him into a superhuman. But Muhammad Rasulullah, no. They said, no, you know what? He never spoke like this. He has never ever uttered such words. Yes, his conduct, his character is flawless. But this knowledge he has never had previously. This penetrative insight to this extent he has not displayed before. In kuntum fi raybim mimma nazzalna ala abdina fa'atu bi suratin min mithlihi. And if you are in any doubt as to what we have revealed upon our servant, then bring a surah from his like, Muhammad's like who has not studied anything. Previously, he has not spoken these words. Look at this. Qala, qul, he's saying to the Prophet, the, the revelation, qul, O Muhammad, law shaa Allah ma talawtuhu alaykum wa la adraakum bihi. If Allah wanted, I would not have recited this Quran to you and I would have not made it known to you. Faqad labistu fikum umuran min qablihi. I have already lived with you a long patch of time. Do you not think then? I have never said these words before this day. Suddenly they're popping out of my mouth. So they are seeing a very real human. In whose humanness he is experiencing revelation. That revelation is shaping him and guiding him. He is evolving with that revelation and as he evolves in his journey, he is imparting his teachings. So the real message of Muhammad Rasulullah was he himself, his own person. As he was progressing, he was becoming an example for the rest. They went to Aisha, Bibi Aisha, and they said, what, were the conduct, what was the conduct of Muhammad Rasulullah? She said, have you read the Quran? The Sahabi said, yes. He said, well, the Quran was his teacher. If you want to see the conduct of Muhammad sallallahu look at the Quran. That was the conduct of Muhammad Rasulullah. So the Quran has nurtured him. Look at this verse. وَمَا كُنْتَ تَتْلُو مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَلَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِكِ Before this day, Muhammad, you are not reciting the book, i.e. the Quran. And you are not writing with your right hand. Had you been reading, reciting and writing, إِذَنْ لَرْتَابَ الْمُبْطَلُونَ Then at that point, the falsifiers would have cause to be suspicious. You have not written anything with your hand. You have not read anything. You have not received this knowledge from anywhere else. Previously, there's no record of you doing these things. It's suddenly popping out. He's a human to the core who is experiencing revelation. The revelation is shaping him. And as the revelation is shaping him, he becomes an example for all. So the real vehicle of change are not the teachings of Muhammad wasallam. It's Muhammad in his entirety. And Muhammad in his journey. So he is not coming at the, at the initial stage as a teacher like Isa, who comes as a teacher to teach them. Right? Isa says, وَآتَانِي الْكِتَابُ وَجَعَلَنِي nabiya." He has given me a book and he has made me a Nabi. Prophet Muhammad does not make a claim like that. As he receives the kitab, he gives the kitab. As the kitab comes to him, it modifies him. As he is being modified, that is the teaching to the onlooker. That is how you're supposed to be modified. What a phenomenal story this is. When we read the Quran and see the Prophet and the circumstances will say, amazing. The Prophet does not come to teach them. The Prophet himself is a model. He is being nurtured and the nurturing that he receives is the teaching for the rest. Now, look at Surah Qiyamah. Now, he was the ideal, ideal recipient for this message. Look at Surah Qiyamah. We have cited this example so many times. That the Prophet in the beginning of the revelation and Maududi comments that this was possibly one of the first surahs and revealed in Makkah. In the Makkan phase, that the Prophet used to struggle to remember the verses. 
So he would pronounce it quickly so they could be inscribed. لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجل به. Do not hasten your tongue. Do not move your tongue to hasten its delivery. O Muhammad, be at ease. We will gather it. We will compile it. We will recite it. If you forget a verse, it's okay. We will replace it with another one. ما ننسخ من آية أو ننسيها. We do not abrogate a verse or cause it to be forgotten, but that we come. Back with a verse of its kind or better than it. These are the human stages of the Prophet. He was going through all these human experiences. And he was the most malleable of all people there. And that's why his prophethood worked. How? The revelation molded him in a context that was looking at him very, very closely. And through him they were learning. So now, <clears throat> the verse that I recited, قُلْ لَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهَ تَلَوْتُهُ Now tell me, if Ruhul Quds or Jibrail comes to any one of us and says, قُلْ in our ear, or sits in front of us, nobody else can see him. He says to me, قُلْ What will I say? I will wait for the instruction, won't I? قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَد I would just say, هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَد Right? Why would I repeat قُلْ? قُلْ means, say so Jibreel is saying, Muhammad, say. Muhammad Rasulullah will ask, what should I say, Jibreel? Who Allah, who Ahad? He is Allah the one. So Muhammad Rasulullah then should speak, he is Allah the one. The Prophet had no need to repeat, Qul, the word say. Now we are all saying it, say he, Allah is one. Till the day of Qiyamah, we'll repeat it. That tells a story. That the prophetic slate was so untarnished, so clean. One of the biggest problems raised against scripture is what? That even if God has revealed it, the recipient, whichever prophet it was, has interpreted it within their own context and then subsequently given it out. Does that make sense? You give me some teaching. I will absorb that teaching, understand it, digest it, then articulate it. The articulation is not the same as what was given to me. If the same thing that is given to me was given to you, you might interpret it differently. But this medium known as Muhammad Rasulullah was such an untarnished medium. Qul huwa Allah ahad. He says, Qul huwa Allah ahad. He does not say, huwa Allah ahad. So he was the most malleable of all the beings around him and that's why he became the most eligible. Now you will say he was chosen from before. Yes, he was. And he was here as well. And he did not even know he was a human prophet. No, he didn't. He found out afterwards and he remembered his possibly own status afterwards. But initially he didn't. And we are going to talk about this the way that he was shaken through the first revelation, the way he was shaken shows that he wasn't aware of who he himself was. But God was. The loftier realms were. Now, the point I want to finish here is that the environment was conducive. This was already decided previously. Everything was coming together at that right time with the analogy of Moses. As Moses strikes the Nile, the right time. The Nile breaks in two. Israelites cross. The Pharaoh, who is now destined to be destroyed, is destroyed. Everything happens at the right time. The context was ripe for the destiny to converge. These were the people who would accept his message. But how will they accept his message? These are not intellectuals. These are illiterate people. So the only message that can impart, be imparted to them is the living message. A standing, walking, talking message. The message is not what Muhammad Rasulullah is speaking. The being of Muhammad Rasulullah is the message. And you will find that the Quran that is being revealed is actually being revealed by and large on the Prophet for the Prophet himself and his mind, the way he understood reality. He was the recipient of the message, 
and he was the embodiment of it. So the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad initially was his own beautiful being. He was modeled by the Quran and as he was shaped and modeled, that became the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to humanity. And we will discover this and dis uh, explore this further in the next nine nights. We come to the shahada of our blessed Imam Hussein, the grandson of the blessed prophet. When Muawiya died, there was an agreement that Imam Hassan made with Muawiya that Imam Hussein had to honor that he will not appoint his successor after his death. So as long as Muawiyah was alive, the Imams would not revolt against him. And the Imams were noble. If they give their commitment, they would not. Now Yazid has come to the position of a Caliph, a Khalifa. And Imam Hussein's bayah is being sought by Walid, the cousin of Yazid. Now Imam Hussein here is not under any constraint of any pledge. If he were to pledge, he cannot revolt. He had two choices, either to abstain or to revolt. We know he went and revolted, but he creates that space for himself by not giving the pledge of allegiance. So when Walid demands his allegiance, the Imam says, would it not be better in the daylight, in the gathering of the people, you seek the pledge of allegiance and then I give it to you. Walid says, yes, indeed. Now you've heard the story that Marwan says, Walid, extract the pledge of allegiance or put him to death. Otherwise you will not find him again. And Imam Hussein, Enraged, raises his voice. The Hashim is walked through. At the aid of Imam Hussein and Walid and Marwan are both shaken at the prospect of death. The next day, Marwan meets Imam Hussein and says, Look, I advise you to give allegiance to the Caliph. Imam Hussein responds, If Islam has become afflicted by a leader like Yazid, then I bid my farewell to Islam. This was the mindset of Hussein ibn Ali, that this religion that is there right now, with leadership of this sort, is not modeled on what my grandfather had given. And this is what we find in his statement. I do not come out in revolt, if that can be a translation, in order to cause corruption or to oppress. I want to call upon the religion of the Prophet of Allah, exhort to good, forbid evil, and go along the path of my grandfather and my father. But what makes Imam Hussein's message successful? is not only his rejection of Yazid or his want to give his life, but the sort of resolve he had and the inner being, and the caliber of his inner being and those around him. And I am a firm believer of this, that it was that spirituality of these people, it was that resolve of these people that has given this message endurance and gives it success after 1400 years for us to sit here and to narrate this in itself is no less than a miracle isn't it now look at those around him and you will see what was really happening <clears throat> muslim ibn awsaja a companion of imam hussein a lover of imam hussein when he fights and he falls from his steed, Imam Hussein and Habib 
reach him. Habib says to Muslim, Muslim, even though I know that I am to join you very shortly, is there anything you would like me to do in this short span of time before I meet with you? The description we hear is that Muslim raised his trembling hand and pointed at Imam Hussein. And he said, Ya Habib, O Habib, alayka bihada shakhs ma dumta hayya. Protect this man for as long as you are alive. It was this passion, belief in their hearts that has caused this message to perpetuate. Rahmallah man al-Fatiha.